Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Always a hard ticket uh, straight after lunch, so uh, uh, following me is, is Ross. And uh, over lunch, we, we discussed that potentially he would offer the free beer and I'd offer the helicopter ride. The, uh, the challenge is I don't have a pilot's licence and uh, we don't know what would go, go best first. But thanks very much to NTCA, certainly to Tracy, to Tom, uh, for the invitation to come back again to Darwin. It's always a real privilege uh, to come up to the crowd. Uh, and, and uh, give an update of a market which is so close to you all and so important to the vitality of our industry. Uh, as introduced, I do live in Singapore. I've been up there the last couple of years, which is pretty much epicentre to uh, the 14 countries of Southern Asia uh, that I work upon. And um, in that, uh, the remit that MLA have for the region, not only for R&D, but also the marketing and market access is a very important part of what I do on a daily basis. The 14 countries going from Vietnam across to Indonesia, or down to Indonesia, from the Philippines across to India, cover a fairly wide uh, and geographic spread. But more importantly, there are a number of countries in that region which are pivotal to live export. And I work both across the live export uh, with other colleagues and in the box beef trade for marketing and market access. That, uh, uh, region also is a, is a, is a very good uh, example of where MLA as a service provider works with LiveCorp, another service provider to industry, to enhance the strategic direction of where our peak councils set the strategy. And working together on a number of areas, both in Indonesia and Vietnam, are, are, are two of the topical uh, points that I want to cover today. To underpin this, I think it's uh, a really uh, Good opportunity just to, to, to reflect on the last couple of days. I flew across from Jakarta yesterday where we had three industry members, all having given up their day job, come up and join me on roundtable discussions with the Red Meat Partnership. And it really highlights how we do join the dots with industry, with the Australian government and with our peers in market to enhance the flow of our market demand and to, to continue that market access option. Across the table, we had uh, all representatives from our Indonesian flow and as I said, we had Cattle Council, we had Live Corp, uh, and we had AMIC representatives all put pitching uh, a position of where Australia needs to be seeding itself over the, the, the coming months and years. To underpin the, uh, the work that we do in region, I've got about $3 million that's spread between those 14 countries. And on top of that, the Live Corp budget of over $8 million is predominantly spread in your levy funds across the regions of Middle East, Indonesia and Vietnam, uh, or should I say, and Southern Asia, with Malaysia, Philippines inclusive in live export. But it's a healthy amount and we can do a lot with that money. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about three distinct layers in this, this presentation. First of all, I'd like to reflect a little on some of the data and the information that we're getting back in from the market that shows just where we've come from and where we're going. Secondly, I think it's uh, a matter of reality that we do address some of the risks that are going on in this region and how it can affect you as businessmen and women uh, looking to your models over the next 12 months. But finally, on a more positive note, I think it's important that we do understand the macro opportunities and reflect on some of the tactics that we need to apply as an industry in this region. So, to start with demand and supply, looking over our shoulder in the last 12 months, it's really good to know that we got over a million head, 1.1 million head of live export cattle out of Australia. And that was with the challenges of season, that was with the challenges of, of uh, disruption uh, three quarters of the way through with permit allocations, etc. And you can see in there that Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines play a majority role in the live export market and have continued to be strong considering all things. Indonesia in particular, taking over 600,000 cattle is one of the top five years we've had in the last 30. So despite all of what we've read and all of what we've heard around Indian buffalo prices and et cetera, et cetera, to see that Indonesia has held so strong over the last 12 months is a credit both to the trade and to you to keep that supply. In Vietnam, We've exported just under 200,000 head last year, but again, it's a drop from where it was, but consistent with a new market that now has many, many SCAS approved feedlots dotted right along the coastline. Again, 
attributable to some of the hard work of the LEP teams that have been working in market to get that going. On the box beef, it was a record year across Asian. Over 120,000 tonnes of our box beef into a market where, again, Indonesia is highlighted as a record uh, intake. Philippines, Vietnam, all in the schedule. Collectively, it's meant that Indonesia has now gone over a billion dollar market. Vietnam over 300 million, and you can see in those percentages of those pie graphs how dependent and how workable the live export market has been in counter to the boxed proportions. However, it's not all rosy, and there are some headwinds, some storm clouds ahead that we need to be cognizant of. And for this, I really want to talk around the risks that will impact and are impacting on our supply chains. You know strangers to the numbers that have been out now for the last 12 months and where our herd populations have come back down to around 26 million. Yes, there is a slight increase predicted over the next couple of years, but these herd numbers have ultimately increased the competition between the processor, between the live exporter, and number three, particularly in the last 12 months, now that we've had a relatively good season, not up there, but your restocker is in. Great to see that cattle are coming back in. But this has had a competing influence on the price of cattle. And sort of, sort of countering a little bit about what Phil was saying before, I believe that price is very important. Not because it just shows you what your return at farm gate is, but because we can also reflect on where our position is against a global market. If you look at this graph here, you can see correlating to the dip in our overall numbers, the Australian price has naturally risen. Compare that to the world. Yes, we're well under where the US was, but against places like Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, others, we're distinctly above. How long can we hold or sustain that price advantage against other aggressive competitors? Referring back to what Alfonso was saying this morning, the Brazilians are out to put an extra uh, uh, one point, uh, sorry, uh, 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 an next percentage of increase of their volumes around the globe. They've got a price advantage to do that, and that reflects in some of our markets and what they're able to take. The price, ultimately, for Australia and our production totals have meant a relatively dormant output. And the prediction going forward shows that it's not going to change much. But if you look at the other three lines, they're our three big competitors. All are increasing over the next five to 10 years. All have got product that has a price advantage of us in the markets that we work in. So, do I think that price has had a bearing on some of our markets? Yes, I do. If you really wanted to do a measure of the confidence in business that are importing our cattle in Vietnam, importing our cattle in Jakarta and Indonesia, they have been impacted by a number of both political decisions and price decisions onto what works. And if you look at January and February, sure, there's a seasonality to what they can take in, but there have been distinct dips in the cattle that have come into the Indonesian market. And whilst March is marginally better, and we're probably a few days away from getting the exact data, there is a slight increase, but well down on where it should be. Particularly that we're only another six weeks out from Ramadan. And I bring this pie graph up just to show you that if our January and February numbers are below what the thresholds are, it feeds into a gap that will be there around the Ramadan period. And this is because one, commerce is saying, hey, it just doesn't quite work. You know, this, this 385 steer that's coming out of Darwin, we're not converting that into a profitable margin, both in Vietnam and Indonesia. And as a result, the replications will snowball in a few weeks' time. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this up in a moment around the political risk that that has involved. Likewise, we look at Vietnam. Across the last six months, commercial reality has driven the importers to a position of conservative imports. And those numbers are again reflected on where Vietnam has come from and where it may go over the next 12 months. So reality check, ladies and gentlemen, is that these markets may not be and most likely will not be as strong as they have been over the last couple of years. So we need to consider that risk and where we're gonna be turning our stock in other directions. 
The other big influence of risk that we all need to be very cognizant of is the political risks of our country. Now, I've got to say straight up that Australia and Indonesia are sharing some very good bilateral uh, um, uh, relations at the moment. You've had the Turnbull government, including both the Prime Minister and a number of ministers, not only welcome the visit of the President of Indonesia, but also reciprocate that with a recent visit into Jakarta. That's a good thing because it's allowing dialogue to continue and to work out some of the, the elements going forward. But let me just see that in, an, in another two years, well actually at the end of uh, 2018, 2019, we are yet to see another general election in Indonesia. And you can be sure that some of the rhetoric that goes on in politics about the popular items of let's be sustainable, let's look at food security and how we do that will be rising amongst the, the ministerial divisions of the Jakawi government. And we need to contend with some of the statements that will come out of those ministries, i.e. we will be sustainable, we will be self-sufficient in rice. Well, to the Jakawi government in Indonesia trade, they are almost 98% at, at the moment. That statement comes to fruition. They've said quite loudly that they want to be self-sufficient in beef, in corn, in sugar and other items. So they're making these statements and we need to counter that with, hey, we're a partner in getting there and we believe that we can help uh, you know, continue that partnership without Indonesia doing it standalone. But I brought up there at the end things like the MUI uh, halal decisions going forward have huge implications for us as business because the government have come out and said that everything will be having a mandatory halal uh, 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 accreditation by the end of next year. That includes pharmaceuticals, food, all the way along the chain. Now, the question for us as a beef industry is what happens to the animals that fall out of halal? There's no supply chain in Indonesia for that at the moment. So resorting from stunning, that doesn't work. That animal is now no longer a halal accredited animal. Do they then go back to the cut techniques that we saw? That has bearings on potentially where we have to sit on a welfare standard going forward. Likewise, we've seen the Indonesian government simply out of the, I suppose, the necessity of saying we want food security, put ceilings on prices, 80,000 80, rupiah or $8 on frozen beef, has placed huge restrictions on those who import it. And they're under the spotlight from their own government to try and ensure that there is some price stability going into the Ramadan period. Now, if you're doing that, or you're trying to do that with a high price that's coming out of the territory and a margin that's really not working, it's pretty much impossible to bring your price back down to $8 a kilogram in that market. So this plays into the political favour that let's bring in a replacement product to replace the high expensive or the expensive product that can't work, i.e. buffalo meat. And that's why we've got this, this uh, competitive interest that started to grow very quickly in a market. The other thing that we've got to be contending with is that there's this stubborn resistance by our partners in Indonesia to say that if we, we have this herd that wants to be self-sufficient. This is an oldie but a goodie driven by ANZ a few years ago that at the moment the decline of the Indonesian herd is, is set to, to get to zero by 2021 on present consumption figures. So naturally the Indonesian government trying to reverse this is saying well let's bring in a breeder policy and we're all across now the five to one okay saying let's replace that with 50,000 Brahmin breeders out of the territory and onwards. This year the statement is we're going to AI four million heifers and produce three million calves. It's these kind of statements that are outlandish and we've got to bring a little bit of reality into it. What this does say however is that we've got a fighting chance of replacing this decreasing volume on a number of fronts. Going up the coast a little further, it's not just Indonesia. I will bring to your attention that we have a major risk uh, in, in Vietnam. And you've all read, no doubt, about the crustacean issue going on in southeast Queensland. Uh, the white spot is a real and present danger to our trade because I'll, I'll go back two years. Horticulture, the standoff between Australia and, Indo and, and Vietnam was that we weren't going to bring in their dragon fruit and their lychees because of potential threat to uh, our horticulture through fruit fly. All of a sudden, a fruit fly was found out of South Australia in some of our horticultural exports. All 28 items were banned and have been pretty much for the last two years. So, 
We put a ban on Thailand, Vietnam and China to say no more crustaceans until we find out where the white spot is. Vietnam will sensitively look at that and say, well, are we going to get in the tick for tack? Believe me, there is a lot of work in the market access space at the embassy level to try and ensure that that doesn't become a trade war. But there has been a precedent sent, ladies and gentlemen, that two years ago it did happen, and our beef is as vulnerable as horticulture. So our 450 kilogram steers in our weight range could potentially be closed at five to midnight. Now, there's been a lot said about competition in the papers and onwards, and I'll say right up front, competition is here to stay. It doesn't matter what market you're in, whether you're in the domestic market, challenged against pork or chicken, or in the international markets against our competitors. And as we saw today with Brazil, there's no stopping the juggernaut there wanting to get into countries. So if you're another country looking at Indonesia, which has got 260 million people, there's little doubt or little wonder that they're all trying to get a bit of that space. We've seen Spain and a few hundred tonnes of their product get into there over the last couple of months. We've seen the Kiwis and the Americans there for a long time, albeit in small quantities. But let me tell you that Brazil, with their increased quantities, are seeing this 260 million people population as a real target market. Now, buffalo meat, yeah. I think our price and I think our fluctuations in supply in the last 12 months have given them a free ride into the market. But that's going to always happen. And we've had, I think we've had the Indians eyeing off India, sorry, the Indians eyeing off Indonesia for far longer than what their entry point was in September last year. So what does that mean on the ground? In a bucket, Indonesia takes around 600,000 tonnes of meat, or requires 600,000 tonnes for its consumer. Locally, that herd of theirs, which is on the decline, produces around 400,000 tonnes. So in easy numbers, about 200,000 tonnes to date has been subsided by the Australian entities. In our live, which is about 130, 140,000 tonnes, and in our boxed, about 60. There's your composite mix. Now, if you've got one end of the scale, declining herd, and you've got the other end of the scale, increasing consumption, there's going to be a natural gap, particularly if that 200,000 tonnes of Australia hasn't been easily met in the last 12 months. That's where the Indian buffalo meat, that's where Brazil is going to initially target. So we've got to try and keep that space that we've got very tight around the edges. Just look at what India has done in the last, or say just up until November last year. They went from zero to hero in four months. They quickly became the fourth largest export destination. Now, the suspension of Indian buffalo meat since, what you read in the papers is yes, there's no more supposedly legitimate imports of the market. Does it stop there? No. There's a caveat in that clause that says you can still bring in buffalo meat if there's an emergency or if there's a price requirement. And that's happening. If you just look at the total, the column here that says total, 110,000 tonnes in the top. The permit for Indian buffalo meat in Indonesia is with one state-owned enterprise, Bullog. Now, to date, they have brought in around 60,000 tonnes of that 110. So they still have a licence to bring in another 50. But the key in this equation is you can see the realisation, that 60,000 tonnes. Underneath that, they've only sold approximately 23, 25,000 tonnes of their meat. So they're sitting on stock of around 35,000 tonnes. The big difference between Indonesia this year and last year, remember that little graph I showed you before, the shortfall in February cattle going into Ramadan? Indonesia has a card up its sleeve, and that's that 35,000 tonnes of stock, which it will feed, if it needs to, back into the market. And this is to stop that price fluctuation that typically happens around that peak period. But what I will say is this. It hasn't been as rapid an uptake as we've imagined. It's been a steady uptake by a consumer that's still very much testing the buffalo. We've done some surveys, i.e. using MLA, LEP combined funds to look at over 200 markets in the region to try and ascertain just what channels. Again, I want to just get you all to concentrate on those little pie graphs up there on the top. You see wet markets, 10%. You see SME, small medium enterprises. They are the two zones where that 60,000 tonnes of buffalo meat is making inroads. Wet markets, yes, 10% of the 10,000 tonnes of the small medium enterprises, the Buxo ball manufacturers, 
So that's where they've got the major inroad against our typical local production or our boxed beef. The implications of that to a consumer or to what we're trying to measure are somewhat unknown, but we're starting to get some trends. The first thing we try to do is, let's go and visualise exactly what's going on in the market. I'm sure that Ross will speak to this in a moment. If you try and spot the difference up there, most of you are cattlemen will notice that a little bit of the hide on the tail will tell you that it's from a bosinicus animal. Yeah? But on the other side, on the hook, the rest of the fresh meat that's hanging on the hook, no way. And I'll let you know that that product over there is Indian buffalo meat. Australian product is very hard to determine. As you walk down the row, I took this photo here last week. First of all, the little cab, the first one, you get this side, is Indian buffalo meat. The next two stands are Australian local, supposedly. And we're only just starting to see a few stands differentiate, not saying buffalo or beef, but differentiate with price. And a more modern type butcher line in Jakarta is starting to list this a little bit more prominently. But there's no signage. And I'm going to come to that in the opportunities. This photo I took at a modern retailer. You notice a moment back when I showed you just what impact buffalo meat has had in Jakarta? Pretty much zero in that hotel restaurant catering trade. Pretty much zero in the high-end retail. But this photo was taken in Malaysia just to demonstrate, can you spot the difference? Now, just looking from the back of the crowd, I bet you can't. But the left-hand trays up there are buffalo. The right-hand trays are Australian meat. Notice a cherry red colour. The Indians have worked out that they can send a young buffalo into this high-end market. It's a young bull off the buffalo dairy herd. And that is what it looks like when it comes to the retailer. At the consumer level, you get your, your beef or your buffalo served up as a buxo ball. Can you tell the difference? Absolutely not, once it's cooked. So, there's a risk in that. There's also an opportunity. I also look very closely at whether this is going to impact on the manufacturing business. When you can go quickly into a thing and see whether it's got Australian label or local beef, etc., or whether it's got factually beef used in it. Looking at the manufacturing components in Indonesia, there's about 30,000 tonnes of requirement into that market. So far, so good. They've only taken up about 10,000 tonnes. Sorry, 10%. 3,000 tonnes in this. So it's quite a small volume. It has a significant upturn if they start getting it right. But at the moment, the manufacturers are resistant to taking up buffalo because of those barriers, i.e. the government decided to suspend buffalo. So this continuity of supply is a little bit uncertain with some of the professional ends. But it's their cost of labelling, their cost of registration that they don't want to throw out the door, so they're still using beef. And that's a good thing for us in the short term. OK? Just note, however, the drivers that could change them is that Buffalo CL is consistent with what you need to make a pie or what you need to make a sausage or a lasagna. So they can interchange it, and they will, if they think that there's a long-term curve in it. OK, what's the consumer doing? On the ground, are there drivers that we're seeing a trend in? Consumers, when they go to those wet markets I was showing you there before, a wet market teller, seller will tell us that, hey, 80% of my product is sold as either beef or buffalo. So 20% sold as buffalo. The other pie chart on the other side is, do the consumers know? Well, 90% of us are saying they do. I treat that as a little bit dubious because ultimately it'll be the seller saying, yes, it's beef, it's buffalo, and the consumer not knowing because I can't tell the difference. And I reckon I've been in the game just as long as them. So that pie chart in the middle is telling us three things. Price, price, and price. To meet this overall demand is going to be a driver of some of that wet market activity. Consumers ultimately are driven in Vietnam and Indonesia by this affordable price, by having something fresh and something that is safe to consume. Does a consumer of Jakarta differentiate between a local animal that's Indonesian and an Australian? No. As long as it's fresh, as long as it's affordable, as long as it's safe, they will go for it. So, as a result, for 30 years, Australian beef has been going into those Jakarta markets and there's been no need to differentiate local from Australian. It sells well together. Right now, however, you've got this third competitor, Buffalo. So, the need is now. We need to differentiate that product from the two. 
one of the things that can represent support for that is let's look down the middle and say 72% of our consumers up there say they won't buy buffalo meat at this stage of those surveyed. 54% are saying they have no specific requirement for other. So I believe that's a target that we need to really focus on. And that's where some of our marketing opportunity needs to continue. So there are risks, ladies and gentlemen. Let's be real. You've got price, you've got politics, you've got competition. Those three there will have bearings on just where our market go. But I'm an optimist, and so are you by nature, so we've got to look at how we tackle what is actually real in our market. And the opportunity going forward for me is every day I wake up, we're waking up in a world like we just saw from Rabobank today, like we saw from, uh, from the others, that this globe is looking to consume meat. And ASEAN, where we are, is no different. The numbers are staggering. We've always seen this growing middle class, this increased disposable income, impact on what consumers are wanting. But what does that mean for a local level in Indonesia? The reality is there's about 7 million consumers in the greater Jakarta region that are over $15,000 a year. They're the people that are buying your product. If you look at the higher echelon, those over $35,000 a year, there's only about a million. But both are forecast to increase quite rapidly. So that, that macro level will drive our optimism to say there will always be this gap between what local can produce and what the importers, i.e. us Australia, can provide. In Vietnam, it's not dissimilar. The numbers you know, are mind-boggling when you look at where we are in 2012 to where we're going. Millions and millions of people are meeting this middle class which will drive our consumption. And that's reflected ultimately in what population and income will drive in our two key markets. And I should have say our four livestock markets there out to Malaysia. Population, income, all bode well for our industry. Let's not forget that. It's how we manage those markets, how we differentiate those markets that will be key to our viability and profitability. The transformation or transition in markets between what's going on from a traditional market to a more modern is happening. As I said, I can show you there butcher shops in Jakarta now that are starting to do the price range. I believe the more sophisticated these chains become, the more they will turn back to Australia as its supply base. And I think we've got some things in this country that are so good that we're not yet promoting up in that country like our traceability, all of our on-farm systems that we can amplify that need to be done more in this live export space. Something we haven't needed to do to date because we haven't had this competition. This growth and rapid evolution of QSR. Again, the big chains that we deal with, whether you're McDonald's in America or whether you're a house food curries in Japan. This drive here to say, I want integrity in the supply system by those manufacturers will start determining how much of that base, of that 30,000 tonnes a year of manufacturing, we continue to occupy as our own. Because India doesn't have it, we do. And going back a little bit before, just to what uh, our colleague from Millwood Brown was talking about, some of the rapid changes in consumer. Two years ago in Jakarta, you didn't see some of the convenience sectors like we do today. I can tell you that this little company up here, Gojek, three years ago was a group of 10 entrepreneurs. Today there are 250,000 employees in that company. And what they do is they, one, ferry people on the back of a motorbike, two, they home deliver your meal. You can get all of your supermarket goods delivered to your house in Indonesia now for one dollar. How good's that? What's that mean for fresh, for premium product? The world is our oyster if we can continue to tap into the convenience and modern sector of where these countries are going. They're beating Australia on this sector of convenience. Finally, some of the tactics that I think we do need to address going forward. With all the pricing issues aside, with all of the politics and so forth, there are some key elements that I think we need to, to take hold of. In the boxed beef, which I've spent a lot of my time really focusing on point of differentiation, this business development training market knowledge has allowed us to take a global brand into countries in Southern Asia that differentiate. As a result, you get supermarket fronts now in my part of the world, which will have true Aussie branding. And that is the draw card because we are a safe, natural, healthy nation. We haven't done this in live export because our cattle stop at the port. MLA certainly haven't had a mandate to market live imported cattle because it's adulterated with local product. But believe me, in the box beef, which is defined by country of origin, we retain our premium and our margins because of that. So lesson here 
is when you can go into a modern supermarket now in Jakarta and they say, the more aggressive we can become on doing this, the better you're out, you are. Isn't that a lesson for us all? Because when I look at the live cattle, we've got these great feedlots, we've got far more sophisticated processing chains, but we've stopped short of the butcher shop. So what we're starting to see now because of this are these pilot programs driven by a few entrepreneurial importers, pilot programs to say, let's try and take up our own, this dug-in supper, supper, sorry, which is this uh, our beef, local beef, is, is something that's going to evolve. And I believe evolve very quickly because point of difference is key. I would love to walk down that, that uh, wet market that we saw before and see some form of differentiation because at the moment you can't and it's guesswork. And if I'm a consumer, I want to be able to know that difference. The second tactic, which I've just come from out of Jakarta, is continuing to support the partnership of investment. And, I, and I've got to emphasise the importance of something like the Red Meat Partnership, which is a $60 million bilateral investment by our government into the beef industry, the meat industry in Indonesia. That allows the platform, that allows the bridging to continue between all levels of relationships. And from that, we've been able to send out tactical working groups or, you know, th this response teams when required. And I've got to compliment a couple of people in the crowd who've continued to build on these infographics, on these information circuits that can allow from the high level red map partnership down to the ministerial levels, down to the divisions, some of the arguments that we've had to put forward on things like feeders versus breeders. Remember when I was last here in Darwin, some of you might have heard me say and amplify continually that Australia has a natural advantage on being the breeder. Indonesia has a natural advantage on being the feeder. So we need to keep amplifying that all the way along the chain. And you can only do that if you simplify the message and continue to state your position. And people in the LEP team, Sam Brown, industry leaders like Troy Setter, etc., have been up there banging that drum. To date, you've seen the win for Northern Territory that you've got heavier weights at 450 kilograms, you've got increased uh, age limits to 48 months, you've now got permits that are open. These are big changes from where we are last year. And these are responses of ongoing work between service providers like Livestock, uh, Live Corp, MLA, tactical working groups that have been up there driving those changes. But I just got to say, this has not just been a stop start, you know, whim type approach. It's been the build up of years. Things like secondary cuts and offal, which have been years in the pipeline. We got over the road uh, 12, uh, sorry, uh, 18 months ago. Massive wins for industry because that's allowed that 60,000 tonnes of beef to get into Indo, 12,000 tonnes of offal. But we've still got ongoing. The 50,000 breeder program, the 120 days on feed that make this 450 kilogram animal more viable and more ready, and this five to one ratio are things where we will present reasoned argument to our counterparts through Red Meat Partnership and other bridges in Indonesia to make it workable for you. And I will say, to make it workable for Indonesia. So remember this, when dealing with Indonesia, we've got to presume that we're just not there for commerce. Everything that we can do to show that we're valued partners in a chain through training and through other is important. Colleagues in LEP in Vietnam are working on that very thing now and uh, strategies such as centres for excellence so that we can combine training with partnerships in, in Vietnam is critical so that the governments see us doing more than India. The governments see us doing more than Brazil to maintain our platform. Finally, the, sorry, the, the third last one of the tactics is this global hub of Halal. Now it's a long term call, but believe me, where Halal business is going, where the changes between MUI and the Ministry of Religion in Indonesia are saying, Indonesia has a long term intent on returning the investment further than just cattle being disembarked at final beef value, but looking at whether they can compete with their Malay, with their other Halal regions to get product in. So we've got to be looking at that space so that our chilled beef going to the market is doing more than just providing local sausages through the retail, but it's looking ultimately at linking into supply chains that can go further afield. Now we do this with Japan, we do this with China, we do this with America, so that we link into the taps that re-export, and that will add volume or value 
to our, our industry because they look at us as the integrity supplier. Finally, how we continue to get this information out is through this PR and growing scale of social media. We heard our colleagues talk about it today. An example, with some of my food service linings up there, is to get a message out which very quickly went viral to 704,000 social media visits on what our story was around meat in motion. I looked at some of my colleagues there out of the Red Meat Partnership the other day, some of the, the, the counterparties of what we're doing, their total numbers were 40 social media hits. So there's a lot of work to do in getting some of these wonderful messages that our industry is doing out in a dual type social media read. And you look at some of the headlines that are done in this live corp uh, infographic. The social benefits, the economic investment, employment, education, resource utilisation are all wonderful stories that we need to continue to tell better and broader in Indonesia so that we're not just talking to our own. So that is one of the key tactics going forward the next 12 months. I love this photo because how many times have you seen a McDonald's that has a full sign outside it? This is Asia for you. Turn back because we've got too many customers, they say. Well, I think our mantra is let's keep exporting to every one of the countries that we deal with is full. But beware that every other country that competes with us is looking at the same mantra. And we will have competition, we will have price competition, and there will be political fluctuations along the way. The key thing, the key thing is we'll keep our focus on our quality, our market access, and a point of difference when we're in those markets. Thank you.